what's the biggest problem you see today in the world that's not getting talked about enough? Well, I don't know if it's not being talked about enough, but rather perhaps it's not being talked about properly. And I think that is the uh, the infinite ability of people to be parasitized by bad ideas. Uh, and this is really the point, I mean, not to plug my next book, but that's really the point of my next book, which is the idea that in the same way that organisms can be parasitized by actual parasites, and specifically uh, parasites that can go to your brain and cause you to behave maladaptively, I argue that there's a second class of parasites called idea pathogens that cause us to also behave maladaptively. And so uh, I think ultimately much of the calamities that we see in the world, other than the ones that are happening from you know, natural calamities, come from man-made problems. And these man-made problems come from us holding bad ideas. And so what I try to do in my next book is hopefully, well, first document the problem, but then offer ways by which we can inoculate ourselves against bad thinking. How do you think about bad ideas that are inherently obviously bad, like people believing in flat earth versus bad ideas that are societally accepted like religion? <laughs> well, that, that, that's a great question. So let me, let me give you a sense of the ones that I'm tackling in the book. Uh, so what I do is I follow very much the, the if you'd like, the approach of a uh, virus hunter, an epidemiologist who's looking first uh, to see where the outbreak happened, right? Where is patient zero? And then how the virus spreads and then how you could contain it. And so I argue that at least the bad ideas or the class of bad ideas that I'm interested in covering in this book really stem from the ecosystem called the university. Uh, you know, you, it really takes highly educated people for, to come up with really stupid ideas. And, uh, and so things like postmodernism, right? The idea that there are no absolute truths. We are all contextually bound by, by our relative, you know, idiosyncratic biases. Well, that by definition is a form of intellectual terrorism, right? Because science does presume that there is a truth out there to be discovered. We may sometimes not do a good job at discovering it. We may think that we had a truth and then it's only provisional. Later, we revise our truth. But we certainly start off waking up in the morning thinking that there is a process by which we can try to better understand the world. Well, postmodernism says no. Uh, so that would be a bad idea that then has huge amounts of downstream bad effects. Uh, do you want me to talk about other ideas or do you want to jump in? Let, let's jump into some of the effects and then we'll jump into other ideas as well. Uh, so, well, you can end up then with... A, a huge slew of discipline, quote disciplines, that are perfectly removed from any sense of reality, right? Uh, as was recently uh, highlighted really well with the grievance studies uh, project. Are you familiar with that? Do you know what that is? I, I'm not. Can you quickly? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Agree, George. So, so, so the the background is as follows: uh, Alan Sokal, who is a physicist at uh, New York University. In 1996, uh, wrote a gibberish paper and sent it to one of the leading postmodernist journals. Uh, it was accepted, and then he said, "Oops, guess what? It was a hoax, right?" Because he wanted to demonstrate that you can generate, you know, gibberish postmodernist postmodernist jargon that is completely bereft of meaning, but it can be lauded as, you know, wonderful academic insights. Well, now fast forward 22 years later. Three people uh, decided to, if you, it's not colloquially called SoCal 2.0, decided to send 20 gibberish papers, not one, 20 papers to some of the leading journals in feminist theory and queer theory and critical race study and all the, the, the other rest of the nonsense. And seven of those papers were accepted in top journals before then, you know, it was found out that it was, you know, part of a project that they were doing. Well, now imagine that not only from a purity perspective, from an epistemological perspective, having these types of disciplines that are nothing but injuries to, to science, to reason, to reason, that's already problematic. But think about the opportunity cost of all the students over the past 40 or 50 years who have spent all of their time, if not their parents' tuition money, uh, attending these you know, complete bullshit fields rather than spending their time studying. Now, I don't mean to imply, by the way, that you can't study the humanities seriously or you can't study sociology seriously 
Of course you can. Not everybody is going to become a neuroscientist and a biologist and a uh, psychologist, but you could still always ground it with a commitment to reason, to logic, and so on. And so at the very least, that already shows you that there are many, many generations of students that have been completely devastated by this garbage. I think the example brings up two problems. A, the example, it's obviously a problem with the theory itself of postmodernism. But the other example is confirmation bias. And I think that one's more prevalent in today's society. People believe something, so they find what they want to believe and accept that without question. What are your thoughts? So give me give me an example of how you're linking confirmation bias to postmodernism. Ed. So they they published uh, they tried to publish to twenty publications. The publications saw what they wanted to hear. They confirmed their biases and then published without really thinking. Oh right. I mean, it might be the case that uh, the fact that those papers were published is a manifestation of the confirmation bias. But I would actually argue there is a a more insidious explanation for it. When when your whole field is based on the random generation of gibberish, then anything goes, right? There is no framework by which I can judge something to be worthy of publishing or not, right? As a matter of fact, by the way, when SoCal announced that the paper was gibberish, you would have thought that this would be a devastating, you know, a, you know that would be the death of the field. They just doubled down by simply saying, this proves nothing. As a matter of fact, we were able to extract meaning from your paper, even though you're saying that it's gibberish. So it's an infinite well of BS. So yes, perhaps in part there is confirmation bias, but I, I truly think that the, the epistemology of the field or lack thereof allows anything to be considered to be a worthy contribution. I'll just give you a very quick uh, other example of this. Uh, Postmodern art has a similar, uh, if you like, uh, lack of rules. You could take an empty canvas, and, which was literally the case when I w visited the Carnegie Museum in the, I think in 1996. Uh, you could take an empty canvas and you put it as part of your art collection. And as a matter of fact, when I saw that, when I was visiting the museum, I demanded to speak to the curator. They brought some assistant curator to see me who asked, how can I help you, sir? To which I said, what is this garbage? Why do you have an empty canvas? And of course, the answer was, well, isn't it beautiful, sir? This allows us to have an organic conversation about the piece, right? So when there are no rules, it's intellectual and aesthetic terrorism. Anything goes.